Are you holding back on travel plans because you're afraid of the language gap? Well, no need to mind the gap if you have Babbel. Speak like a whole new you with Babbel, the language learning app that gets you talking. With quick 10-minute lessons handcrafted by over 200 language experts, Babbel gets you talking a new language in three weeks because talking is the key to really knowing a language. Babbel is designed for real conversation. And I can say that that's true because I used Babbel before my recent trip. I went on to Germany, which is a language that I never studied before, but I really wanted to be just comfortable with things like navigating my way around um, a train station or a bus station to be able to order food in a cafe or to say I'm sorry if I bump into somebody on the street and Babbel is perfect for that. So I was able to travel over there with confidence, um, knowing just a bit more German than I did before. Here's a special holiday deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash vulgar. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash vulgar, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash vulgar. Rules and restrictions may apply. Bingo Blitz Rules! If your bingo has ads in it, that's not a bingo. If it doesn't have the coolest tournaments, mini games, and the most breathtaking design, nope, not a bingo. If your bingo moment makes you feel so excited that you just want to burst in joy and scream out loud, bingo! Sorry, so you're playing Bingo Blitz? Now that's a bingo. Come for a world of excitement with Bingo Blitz, the number one free bingo game. Download Bingo Blitz and play for free. Now that's a bingo. Hello and welcome to Vulgar History, a feminist women's history comedy podcast, and have a haunted Halloween. It's our annual Halloween special, which is a thing that I borrowed from, honestly, Dawson's Creek, which if you used to watch Dawson's Creek back in the day, I don't think they had a Christmas episode, but they always had a Halloween episode. And I just happened to have started doing Halloween themed episodes for this. And now it's always really exciting and a bit challenging sometimes to find what's going to be the topic each year to find something that is appropriately scary and gruesome. And this actually worked out so perfectly because a friend of the podcast, Gavin Whitehead, is joining us today. Gavin is the host of The Art of Crime, which is a history podcast about the unlikely collisions between true crime and the arts. Ooh, and if you're listening, do you hear that scary sound of a a cat? (laughs) Hepburn, my cat, is here as well, adding to the Halloween vibes. She's my familiar. Anyway, so Gavin is a friend of the podcast. I was on his podcast a bit ago, and he's returning the favor. And so he he just did a whole season about Madame Tussaud, who maybe you didn't know, was a person, not just a name of a international franchise of wax museums. And Madame Tussaud lived literally through the French Revolution. It's exactly the time period we're talking about on the show. So it's still saying in context for this with season seven, the whole Marie Antoinette series, but also the French Revolution. Inherently, there's a lot of heads being chopped off and there's a lot of of scary, creepy things going on. A lot of gruesome things. Anyway, it's the perfect, perfect guest, perfect topic for this episode. So, I mean, we're going to be talking about Madame Tussauds. So I mean, like, enjoy if you dare. So, Gavin Whitehead, welcome to Vulgar History. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm so happy to be here. I'm really happy you're here. And it's just such a lovely coincidence that you just finished your season on Madame Tussauds, just as I'm doing a whole, as I'm beginning to talk about the French Revolution and her story is perfect. Yes. Yeah, to segue into that. Happy coincidence. Absolutely. Well, and also just like returning the favor. I was on your show. I know you're on my show. Exactly. So... We were just talking before we were recording. So we're talking about Madame Tussauds, who I just want to let people know, like sometimes there's a name that has become so iconic, you kind of don't think that it's a person. And Madame Tussauds, I think, is one of those names just because the museums are so famous. Can you explain how, what we're going to call her? So we decided before we hit the record button that we would just refer to her as Madame Tussaud or perhaps Madame T for the entirety of the episode, just for the sake of simplicity, but also because that's how we know her. That's how we've come to know her. And it just feels right to refer to her by that name. Yeah, like she was not born Madame Tussaud. That is very much her married name. 
I was just trying to bring up like a little document in front of myself to follow along. And then it's like Madame Tussaud, like everything that comes up when you Google this is just the museums. It's like, no, the person. It's it's a person. <laughs> That's right. There was a person. So you did a whole season about Madame Tussaud. Yes, correct. So I am the host and creator of a podcast called The Art of Crime. It's a history podcast about the unlikely collisions between true crime and the arts. Each season is structured around a different theme. So I just wrapped up my third season, which is called Queen of Crime, Madame Tussaud and the Chamber of Horrors. And so the way it works is that each episode kind of tells two stories. Over the course of the entire season, we cover the biography of Madame Tussaud kicking off in pre-revolutionary France and wrapping up in Victorian London, which is where she finished her life. Each episode covers a chapter of that story. So at the same time, I chronicle the evolution of this exhibit inside the Wax Museum called the Chamber of Horrors. And this is sort of where the true crime component comes in. So the Chamber of Horrors exhibited likenesses of notorious murderers, as well as various macabre relics associated with the French Revolution, which we'll get to in due course. Um, So just as each episode of this season advances the story of Madame Tussaud's life, each episode is also structured around around a noteworthy crime or criminal that was depicted in the Chamber of Horrors. I just want to let everybody know um, about the Chamber of Horrors, which it was briefly removed from Madame Tussauds in London. But you you broke the news to me that it's back. It's back, baby. It is back. And I don't know if it's better than ever, but it's back. Um, Yeah, it went away for a few years. I, I want to say in 2016, it was a recent development. They closed down the Chamber of Horrors and replaced it with the Sherlock Holmes experience. So there's still a kind of murder mystery vibe with what replaced it. But I remember feeling so sad when I heard about this because the Chamber of Horrors had been around for well over a hundred years. And in fact, its earliest antecedent goes back to like the end of the 18th century. So it just it felt like they were wiping away so much history by making that change. And I was so glad to see that they had brought it back. I was so happy they brought it back. So when I was a young child, my family, we went on a trip to London. I was probably like nine or 10 years old. And I don't remember much, but I I remember going to Madame Tussauds and I remember going to the Chamber of Horrors and it like imprinted on me. It was, I, I remember seeing the Chamber of Horrors and I remember seeing like the torture chambers at the Tower of London. And I was this little kid who was just like, true crime is now my passion. <laughs> so when I went to London a bit ago, I was like, oh, I want to see Madame Tussauds. And I had thought that the Chamber of Horrors was gone. So I didn't even go there, but it's back. So next time I go, I need to see it. Yeah. Next time. I've never been to the Chamber of, I've never been to the Tussauds in London. And so I've never been to the Chamber of Horrors, but it's definitely on the bucket list. I, I'm going to assume because this was like when it went away, it was a recent ish development. And I could see they were like, oh, this is may- maybe they thought it was in bad taste or maybe they thought it was they wanted to. I think but up to those the ads you see right now are very much like come and see all the celebrities. So I think they're leaning into that versus the history. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. But so Madame Tussauds. So this is also I should mention we're recording this a bit earlier, but this is our Halloween special. Right. So it's going to get gruesome. Um, Even just when I was researching this, like every picture in the Madame Tussauds biography I was reading was a picture of a wax, um, of a wax work. But some of them are so gruesome. (laughs) They're so realistic looking. Yeah. 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 So it's kind of like, well, like Halloween, you know, like people put decorations on their lawn. It looks gruesome, but really it's just fun. It was gruesome. But one thing, and we'll get to this in a minute, and you mentioned like, you know, the the museum has kind of moved away from presenting itself as a historical institution, an institution dedicated to historical instruction. In Tussaud's lifetime, these grisly relics of the French Revolution were seen as instructive. They were seen as tools that were teaching Victorians about what it was like to live through the French Revolution. Yeah. And for them, it was recent history. Yeah. It was people who they... We'll talk about this. We'll talk about this as we go. I found it also fascinating. This story really... um, She lived for a long time. Spoiler. And she... um, Her life inter... Like, she lived through so many major historical things. And she captured them all in wax. And it was sort of like... Like, when she really settled in England later in her life, it was sort of the... You know, there wasn't Instagram. There wasn't um, TMZ. But it was a way that people 
like everyone was talking about a famous celebrity or a royal or something, but she made it so you could go to Madame Tussauds and see what that person looked like. Like it was really like of the moment. It was a way. I'll just say one thing because I'm I'm working on writing this book about Carolina Brunswick. Mm-hmm. And um, so like when Carolina Brunswick, when she was on her adultery trial, Madame Tussauds had a Carolina Brunswick figure. She had a figure of Caroline's husband, Prinny, and she made a waxwork of Caroline's alleged lover, this Italian man, because people just wanted to see what these what they look like. Like she just knew this is what the audiences were interested in. And yeah, she really whatever was going on, she made a waxwork of it. It was very impressive. Yes. A little erotic intrigue there as well. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So you're going to sort of guide us through this story and I'm just going to, I'll just pop in <laughs> with, with questions and fun facts. But so can you start us off, Gavin, with like Madame T as a girl? What, yes. where was she born? What was her situation? What's, what's her childhood like? So Madame T is born Marie Grossholtz in 1761 in Strasbourg. The birth certificate names Joseph Grossholtz and Anna Maria Grossholtz as her mother and father. Her father ends up dying roughly two months before she's born, so she never meets him. And not long after her birth, she and her mother move to Bern, Switzerland, which is where Anna Maria, so Madame T's mom, gets a job as a housekeeper in the household of a guy named Philippe Curtiu. And if you want to know about Madame T's rise to fame, you have to know a little bit about Philippe Curtiu and who he was. So Curtiu was a practicing physician in Bern. Now, back in the 18th century, medical students needed to know the human anatomy inside and out, right? But the problem was that there were limited ways of actually studying the human anatomy because the ideal way to gain that kind of knowledge would have been to look at fresh cadavers, right? Actually open up human beings and see what it looks like in there. But they had limited access to refrigeration, so there were obvious problems. So what they did as an alternative is that medical students and medical professionals would create wax anatomical models of the human body. And that was part of how they learned where everything was inside the human body. So Philippe Curtiu not only studies anatomical waxes, but he gets really good at making them. And once he realizes that he has this talent as a wax modeler, he starts to branch out and he starts to make wax portraits of wealthy people in Bern. He also starts to make kind of more erotic wax models, some that were outright pornographic. And he kind of makes a name for himself. And eventually he comes to the attention of a member of the French royal family, the Prince de Conti. He allegedly visits Curtiu at his home in Bern, Switzerland, lays his eyes on all of his wax works, and is so impressed that he just pledges his patronage right then and there. He's like, listen, you, I want to support what you do. This stuff is amazing, but there's a condition you have to move to Paris. So Curtiu accepts this deal while Madame T and her mother are still living in his household. And he moves from Bern, leaving them behind temporarily. He moves from Bern to Paris and sets up shop there. Now, a few years later, he actually invites Anna Maria Grossholtz and Madame T to join him in Paris. This is in the late 1760s. And so the mom, Madame T's mom, she's like a servant in the household. Exactly. Yeah. So she would have cooked meals, would have kept the house tidy. Uh, By all accounts, she could whip up a mean casserole, you know. But Curtiu's decision to invite them to live with him in Paris has fueled speculation about the exact nature of his relationship with Madame T's mother. Some people have wondered if there may have been some kind of romantic relationship because, you know, he could have hired a new housekeeper just fine in Paris, right? Why Why would he invite the her to join him there. So the exact nature of that relationship is a mystery for the ages. We'll never have the answer. But it's very clear that Madame T had a close, almost familial kind of relationship with Philippe Curtiu. She referred to him as uncle for the rest of her life. Um, And Philippe Curtiu teaches Tuso everything that she knows about wax modeling. And she Can starts I, to... I just, I, I just want to say, just pause for a second. The incredible coincidence that this happens to be the household her mother got a job in and that Madame T happens to have this 
talent in, in a know. specific thing. It's just like, great, but like, what are the chances? Yeah. And it's not just that she can learn and is willing to learn, but that she's like one of the best people in the world at it. Yeah. It's staggering. Yeah. The coincidence, mm-hmm. as you point out. So she learns how to model in wax at a very early age. And I thought it might be fun to talk through this process a little bit. Please. Um, because it takes extraordinary skill and parts of the process are mind blowing to me. She would have started by modeling fruits and flowers, things like that, before she graduated to representing human subjects in wax. But eventually she shows a lot of skill and she moves on to sculpting human beings in wax figures. So here's how it works, basically. The most important part of any wax figure is also the most difficult, and that is the head. It's like if you cannot get the head of the wax figure right, the whole thing is ruined. The way it works is that you would start by making a detailed sketch of the intended subject. So we'll say Marie Antoinette or Madame du Barry or Napoleon Bonaparte, whoever. You make a detailed sketch of that person's head. Then you make a clay model working from that sketch. And again, you want this clay model to be as accurate and lifelike as possible. Once you have that clay model, you coat it in liquid plaster. And then once you've done that, you remove the liquid plaster. So again, the liquid plaster has basically formed this kind of outer shell around the clay model, if that makes sense. Once it has set, you remove it in pieces and then reassemble those pieces of liquid plaster using a sophisticated peg and socket system. So basically now what you have is a kind of hollow cranium that is made of liquid plaster. And here is where the wax comes in. So you heat up wax so that it is molten and then you pour it very carefully into this plaster cast and you fill it up to the brim. And again, this this part of the process requires extreme care because one wrong wobble could again compromise the the finished product, could give you a wrinkle where you don't want it to go. There are all kinds of problems that could crop up because of it. So you fill this caster and set it aside to let it cool. Now, the way it works is that the wax that is actually closest to the liquid, to the plaster cast, it's no longer liquid at this point, the wax that is closest to the outside will harden first. And then once that has hardened, you dump out all of the wax that's in the middle of the the, uh, the head. So basically what you're left with is, again, another shell, another outer layer of wax that is basically the outside of the head. It's maybe two inches thick, and that is your head. So once you have the head, this is where it gets really interesting. You have to set glass eyeballs in the sockets. So what Madame T would do is she would reach up through the neck of the head and then insert the glass eyeballs from the inside. Again, this takes a lot of care because you don't want a wax figure that looks cross-eyed or squinty or anything like that. And then this is the really crazy part. She would insert human hair one strand at a time We're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of individual strands of hair. Would you care to hazard hazard a guess as to how long this part of the process took to complete? I don't even know. Um, Like three months. Okay, it's actually shorter than that. But it's, it's, thank God, but it's still shocking. It's 10 to 14 days. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Of just intensive, just hair Yeah, it would take between, exactly. I mean, think of how mind-numbing that is. It would just drive me crazy to do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. And um, when necessary, they would insert real human teeth in the wax figures as well. And so once you had the head, you had the hardest part done. Um, The rest of the figure was really actually not made of wax at this point in history. It was mostly wood and leather. And it was sort of just like a skeleton. It was just there so that you could hang pretty clothes on them. Because as we'll talk about probably later, you know, the costumes of the wax figures were a huge part of the appeal of the wax museum. And Philippe Curtu and Madame Tussaud collaborated with some of the most august designers of the day. And so you outfitted the wax figure and then you made the hands and, and then you were done. So that that's the process of, of making wax figures. So you asked about where Madame Tussaud grew up a little bit as a girl. So at this point, she's moved to Paris. And around 1770, Philippe Curtiu opens up his wax museum, already 
renowned within Paris on a street called the Boulevard du Temple, which is kind of at the heart of Paris's entertainment industry. It sounds really awesome. The Wax Museum is there and his house is also there. So Madame T and her mother are there. They're working in the Wax Museum all day long, making wax figures, taking money from customers, making sure the the premises is neat and tidy, et cetera, et cetera. And who are the customers? Are they the wealthy elites or are they just kind of like the everyday people? I think it's a little bit of both. It's definitely geared toward anyone who has time and money to pay to enter the wax museum. But the Boulevard du Temple did combine people from all strata of Parisian society. So you you could see courtiers and courtesans, but you could also see um, lower income people. There, the street was actually rife with crime. It was known as the Boulevard du Crime. So there was a lot of money floating around in the area. And there was also, you know, some more impoverished people there as well. So I think it would have been a mixture of rich and um, not so rich patrons at the, the wax museum at the Boulevard du Temple. Now, they also opened another wax museum at the Palais Royal in 17. 17- 84 or thereabouts. And that definitely uh, catered to a classier, more upper class clientele. It was called the Salon de Seer. So it was presented as this kind of salon. It's very exclusive and you had to pay more to get in if you really wanted to inspect all the sculptures. Well, right, because I want to just mention, so we've been slowly, similar to what you did with your Madame Tussauds season, we've been doing building slowly towards learning more about Marie Antoinette's life eventually. We've talked on the show about like Versailles and kind of the the extreme etiquette and stuff that was going on there. So I could see that the the very wealthy noble people would were living in their own separate sphere. So now they kind of have their own wax museum that they can go to without having to go to this other boulevard to interact with like the everyday people. Yes. And since you mentioned Versailles, I think it's important to note that the royal family sort of had pride of place at the the wax salon. So the kind of more upper crusty salon that was at the Palois Royale. And in a previous episode, you talked about um, what's called the Grand Couvert, that it's a weekly ritual where people could go to Versailles and watch the royal family eat dinner. Um, that was something that you could do. It's called the Grand Couvert. And I wanted to bring it up because there was actually a tableau of Marie Antoinette, Louis XVI, and assorted other individuals eating dinner um, as if at Versailles. That was a tableau that Curtiu introduced at the wax salon in the Palais Royal. I'm just fascinated by the very idea of the Grand Couvert. Anyone could go to see it at Versailles so long as they adhered to the dress code. Men had to wear wigs, and I believe they also had to carry swords with them. But in the event that you walked out of the house without your sword, which has happened to all of us, <laughs> you know, you leave it at home with your umbrella and you're like, shoot, you know, I'm yeah. having a sword fight in the rain. What am I to do now? But if if in the event that you walked out without your sword, you could get one at the front door, essentially. Okay, can... okay. <laughs> like those restaurants where they give you like a jacket if you don't have yeah. your jacket. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So yeah, you'd go and watch Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette eat. And... By all accounts, Marie Antoinette was always kind of, like, uncomfortable in the public gaze. She hardly ever touched her food. And Louis XVI, by contrast, just kind of chowed down with gusto. He was much more comfortable there. So anyway, if you didn't have the time to make a trip out to Versailles, which could take a few hours, um, you could go to the wax salon and see the, you know, the royal family eating in wax. So is this a good time to bring up Madame? So Madame Tussaud, a lot of what we know about her is she wrote her memoirs. And how truthful are those memoirs? Who knows? But one of the claims that she makes is that she herself went to Versailles um, and hung out there for a while, which did she or did she not? I don't know. But can you explain like what, what she claimed she was doing there? Sure. Yeah. So Madame Tussaud claims to have developed a really intense friendship with a member of the royal family named Madame Elizabeth, who was Louis XVI's younger sister. And we do know for a fact that Madame Elizabeth modeled in wax. She made all kinds of religious figures, like crucifixes, um, things like that. Uh, And supposedly, 
They developed this close bond, and Madame Elizabeth invited Tussaud to live at Versailles with her, sort of as a surrogate sister, but also as a teacher, someone who would help her learn how to uh, model and wax. And Tussaud claims to have slept in an adjacent bedchamber, and they were just inseparable. Um, you know, they would rise early in the morning, go horseback riding, do, do everything together, you know. And she claims to have lived there for eight years um, until about, I think, 1788. So really on the eve of the French Revolution, she claims to have left. And there have been a couple of biographies about Tussaud. And the biographers are sort of divided on this question as to whether Tussaud really spent any time at Versailles. One biographer, Pauline Chapman, takes her at her word, is like, yep, she went to Versailles. But the other two biographers are extremely skeptical about this. And I would say with good reason, because, you know, if you were paid to like empty a chamber pot at Versailles for any extended period of time, there is a record of it somewhere. Like they really (laughs) recorded this stuff meticulously. And there is no record of Madame Tussaud in any where it where it should be, where we'd expect to find it. Um, And she claims to have lived there for eight years. So that definitely casts doubt on this story. However, one thing that I would add is that a lot of members of the royal family did pay like grade A artists to teach them how to do whatever it was they did. And Marie Antoinette was actually one of them because she sought the inst- sought instruction from some of the best actors of the day because, you know, she performed in these kind of private theatricals at Versailles playing characters like shepherdesses and so forth. And then one of my favorite examples is the Comte d'Artois, who is Louis XVI's brother. He actually paid a tightrope walker <laughs> named Le Petit Diable, <laughs> or the Little Devil, who became famous for doing a dance on a tightrope with eggs tied around his feet without breaking them. He became like an overnight sensation (laughs) doing this. Um, This is the kind of stuff that people love to see. I mean, they're just like, oh my, it's amazing. So the Comte d'Artois pays the little devil, the tightrope walker, to come give him private instructions at Versailles and supposedly set a vogue for tightrope walking at Versailles. I mean, can you Mm. imagine that? Just like... French royal family members just trying to walk walking <laughs> with eggs on their feet. <laughs> yes. Versailles was just its own thing. It like, was a, a bizarre universe. Yeah. So as much as I want to believe Madame T was up there and maybe, you know, I don't know what, what you said about the records and stuff. It's like, and what I've learned about how strict Versailles was about who could go there. And it's just like, it seems unlikely that she was there for eight years and no one ever mentioned it in any exactly. written record. But we'll talk about this in a bit. Um, one of the reasons why she might have wanted to make people think she was there is to make, because she eventually went to England and she wanted her life story to sound exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, and so mm-hmm. saying she was in Versailles makes it sound more exciting when she, like, what our next topic is going to be, I think, gets involved in the French Revolution. Exactly. I mean, she had won the patronage of the royal family, right? I mean, what greater honor could you hope for? And then just to close the loop, because I I forgot to mention this. So we do know that um, members of the French royal family were paying for instruction from artists. And we do know that Madame Elizabeth modeled in wax. So to my mind, it's possible maybe Mm -hmm. that Madame Tussaud gave a lesson or two, maybe at Versailles or maybe elsewhere. But yeah, as you say, the whole the claim that she lived there for eight years just is not to be believed. Yeah, no, but I could totally see that she might have given her a lesson or, yeah, yeah, and then just sort of exaggerated that later on when she wants to make herself to, she's a salesman, saleswoman. Like she wants to make her life story sound exciting. So I don't, I would understand why she would take one half hour she spent with Madame Elizabeth and turn it into like, oh, I lived in Versailles for eight years. It's like eight years. Somewhere between a half hour and eight years. Yeah, somewhere between those two. (laughs) That is a radical example of rounding up, I have to say. (laughs) Right up to the closest eight years. Eight years. (laughs) Um, well, because the next thing, like, so she's just like, she's thriving, basically, like she and her um, mentor, like the waxworks, it's going great. It's going great. Like people, Uh they're getting, they've got this patronage, they're like, they're doing great. Um, And then the French Revolution happens. Yeah. (laughs) 
Yeah. Yeah, this things get really tricky here. Um because as the situation heats up and as public sentiment really turns against the monarchy and begins to favor a republic, Curtiu and Tussaud find themselves in trouble, right? Because especially think back to like the wax salon, right? Where you could go see Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI in the Grand Couvert at dinner. I mean, they could be seen to have glorified the monarchy by representing them in that way. And so they're like, oh, that's not us. We're, we're not monarchists. We're not about the royal family. So they quietly retired the Grand Couvert as the situation got more intense. And they took other measures to kind of align themselves and the Wax, inst- the wax Museum as an institution with revolutionary politics. And you can actually trace this evolution in a way that I think is pretty cool. So they had... Um, barkers who walked around in the street and sort of called out to passersby and were like, hey, come check out the wax museum. It's awesome. And those barkers had uniforms or costumes that they wore as part of the job. Now, before the French Revolution, so up until like 1789, they dressed in vaguely aristocratic outfits. So they wore frock coats and things like that. Suddenly, once we get into 1789, 1790, those costumes evaporate, no longer on display. Instead, they're at first dressed as members of the National Guard, which was led by the Marquis de Lafayette, famously. And a lot of the members of this guard were more middle class, so not aristocratic, not like the poorest members of society necessarily, but they're kind of more middle class. And then... As the situation intensifies even more, they uh, re-jig the costumes again and start dressing the Barkers as members of the group known as the Song Coulotte. Mm, We've talked about them. They're the, um, they would wear the big flowing palazzo pants and the like Smurf hats. Exactly, exactly. So they were dressed with the, they were dressed as Song Coulotte. And of course, they were kind of like the ordinary Parisians, workaday guys, like rank and file members of the revolution. So by dressing their barkers, which is the first element of the wax museum you could really see from the street, if you think about it, you're sending messages about where your political allegiances lie to potential customers. Well, and this is, that's, it's so interesting to me to read about people like this who, um, as the French Revolution broke out, this is the first person we've talked about on the show who, like, was, like, were working class people, basically. Like, they couldn't leave. They couldn't flee. They had to just pivot their business um, and keep trying to get people to visit their wax museum in the midst of, like, the French Revolution because, like, that's their income stream. So I like that they were like, okay, we're going to just... It's like um, when the when COVID started and people are like, we're going to do... You, you can pick up at the door now. Like, businesses were just like, we need to we need to keep being a business in the face of this like unprecedented time. So good for them. Good for them for making that pivot. I mean, good for them. Be- yeah. As you say, part of it was about staying afloat as a business. And then part of it was also just like staying alive. because <laughs> True. Um, There are other artists who made statements that were considered politically dangerous and they were either imprisoned or sent to the guillotine. And in fact, Madame T claims to have been imprisoned. We can talk about that in a minute if we want. Madame T claims a lot. Madame T. Madame T, (laughs) she said a lot of things. And in fact, like a claim is rendered dubious by the very fact that Madame T made it. So (laughs) very much so. I do want to say, I don't know if you know the details of this. I just remember because I read one of the Madame T biographies as well, but I thought this was interesting. Just when the French Revolution was first starting, there was some guys who the the mob wanted to like get their heads on pikes because they hated them so much, but they couldn't get those guys. But so they they went to um the wax museum and got the yes. wax heads and then put the wax heads on pikes. And I was like, oh man, that's yeah. It's really intense, but it's it's things happen a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. But what you've pointed to is this amazingly fun fact. This amazing fun fact. So the wax museum where Madame T worked, actually played a crucial role in the outbreak of the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. So, and what you're talking about is in um, 1789, it's two days before the fall of the Bastille, which was July 14th, I believe. So this all happens on July 12th. And I'll summarize just for the sake of time right now, but people are really riled up because Louis XVI has just sacked um, the finance minister, Jacques Necker, 
And he was seen as a friend of the people. Uh, you know, he was going to do whatever he, everything in his power, really, to keep bread prices low, that kind of thing. So Louis the Sixteenth sacks him and people just lose it. They gather actually at the Palais Royal, not far from where one of Curtis Wax Museums used to be. A demonstration grows. They start leaving the Palais Royal and they go to the Boulevard de Temple, partly because they want to shut down theaters because, you know, this is something to be mourned in their eyes. The sacking of Jacques Necker is almost like the death of a really prominent and really beloved official. So like this, we should not be watching plays Mm -hmm. and enjoying live performance today. We need to be mourning this. So they go to shut down the theaters, but they also pop by the Wax Museum. And the reason they go is because they want busts of Jacques Necker, who was one of their heroes, right? And then the other bust they want is the Duke of Orléans, who owned the Palais Royal. That was kind of his house that he had opened to the public. And he also styled himself as a friend of the people, even though he was a cousin of Louis XVI. So they get their busts um, because they're heroes to them. And they oh, kind of... Okay. Pr- exactly. So they're not, yeah. they're not people they want their heads on pikes, but they're like... They want to celebrate them. Exactly, exactly. So they start marching them through the streets um, in this really interesting, almost ritualized (laughs) procession, and things actually turn bloody. So this, this group comes into contact with a battalion of dragoons in Place Louis XV, and the situation escalates, escalates, escalates. Stones are thrown, and then the guards open fire on them. And so this actually becomes the first bloody skirmish in Paris of the French Revolution. And these wax busts were a part of it. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. I just remembered that wax busts were involved with the mob in some way. No, it's one of my favorite stories. So I I was really hoping to tell it. (laughs) Good. I'm glad I brought it up. Um, So the French Revolution is happening. Like, so in order to stay alive, like she and her mentor, Curtu, like they're representing themselves as being on the side of the revolution, basically. Mm -hmm. They're like, we are with you. Also, please pay to come to our wax museum because we are on your side, etc. So you said that she claims that she was arrested and put in a jail cell with Josephine Beauharnais, which is like, okay, okay, sure. Um, (laughs) But what she did, in fact, do um, is make uh, death masks of people during this time. Yes. So as people started going to the guillotine, um, what... Tussaud would do would be to make essentially like wax models of their severed heads. Um, And this was true of prominent revolutionaries like Maximilien Robespierre. Um, She made a model of his severed head and displayed it um, at the wax museum. And she was somehow like, she was like hired to do this. She wasn't just... That's, yeah. Yeah. It's tricky. This is one of those tricky areas. It's sort of like some people think that she might have been hired to do it. Um, There are these kind of mythical stories about how Madame Tussaud would almost be like at the foot of the scaffold ready to collect, you know, the severed head and, and make the wax model. Those might be kind of exaggerated, like so many other claims that she made. But um, there is another story that says that Curtu paid the executioner for access to the severed heads so that they could like make these models. So would this be like, um, in terms of like, it's our gruesome Halloween special. So instead of making a clay head and then like casting from that, like perhaps they were casting from the actual severed head. Yes. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. That's, that's one of the, yeah, that's a possibility. And this is where, um, so also like the narrative of Madame T and the the life story that she would later present, like it's much more effective if she says like, and I was friends with Madame Elizabeth, I knew everyone at Versailles, and then, oh my God, I had to make death masks of all my former friends. Exactly. That's where that that exaggeration might come into play. So that that makes seeing the wax heads even more appealing to people to pay to come to her museum and see them. Yeah. And also... um, it also allows her to present herself as kind of a victim, right? These are people that she knew and, and kind of developed friendships with at Versailles. And, you know, think about it. If if she had just been making these wax heads beca- to appeal to morbid curiosity, she could be seen as like, prop, you know, profiteering basically in this exploitative, immoral way. But it wasn't that. She was friends with these people. 
She also claims to have been forced to make these, which I, yeah, she claimed to have been forced to make these against her will by the National Assembly. So she had no choice and it broke her heart. But, you know, that's what she kind of claimed. I want to just have one more. I just remembered something else that I found interesting. So Madame T, like she was, she was a great, um, like Curtu really started this kind of industry, but Madame T had such good instincts for like business and stuff. And part of that was, making herself a celebrity in a way which mm-hmm. i presume because there's part of her story during this story during part of what we've been sort of like skipping over is like she did get married she became madame t um she becomes madame t yeah and so and she had children um and one of her children died at a young age and then she made a wax figure of the child and put that uh-huh. in a museum so it's just like that's how she's grieving like she's just making wax figures of everything i know it's one of the more touching moments in her entire biography yeah 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 so her first, like i think it was her of, first child yeah so just sort of like the line for her between like and i don't want to i'm not at all here to cast like ethical or moral aspersions against her but she was just uh-huh. like a person making a business so it's like if she was profiteering from the french revolution then like yeah because she had to because this is she needs yeah. to, to stay in business so for, for whatever reason she created these death masks of French Revolution people, which you can still see at Madame Tussauds in London in the Chamber of Horrors. And I saw them when I was nine years old. (laughs) (laughs) And you still bear the scars. I don't know. It affected me somehow. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Just quickly. So there were other relics, like there was a model guillotine that would eventually go on display. You had the severed heads on the walls. um, And then you had a tableau of the assassination of Jean-Paul Marat. Yes. So we're going to talk about that. And uh, I want to say that um, that is one of the things I remember from when I was nine years old and I went to the Chamber of Horrors. I like I went in there, I was just like, oh my God, this is great. And also spooky. And like, I'd heard of Marie Antoinette, but most of it, I was just like, I don't know what any of this is. But I remember the bathtub (laughs) scene. Like, I didn't know who it was or what it was. And when I started doing this season, talking about the French Revolution, I was like, I need to look up that bathtub. What was that bathtub scene? Like, it was so impactful. That's amazing. And and you're here to tell this story. So please. Yes, here we go. So Jean-Paul Marat rose to notoriety as a journalist, really. Um, He was the editor of a publication called The People's Friend. So he was very much revolutionary in his politics. And he was extremely violent in the rhetoric that he used. And he was infamous for this. He called for decapitations. Um, He said, you know, we cannot... uh, he accused some of his opponents of practicing what he called a false humanity. And it's like, listen, if we want change to happen in France, some heads are going to have to roll. You know, that was kind of his philosophy. He eventually becomes a politician and is elected to serve as a deputy at the national convention. And um, at this point, there are two factions that we have to keep track of. The Jacobins, who are the most radical revolutionaries, and then the Girondins, who are more moderate revolutionaries. So Marat has no party affiliation, but he allies himself with the Jacobins. So he's like the hardest of the hardcore. And even while he's serving in government, he starts to write, like he basically incites rebellion against that government because he claims that there are enemies within and they're actively trying to undermine the the revolution. And I should say too that his, his base consists largely of the sans culottes. So like these workaday, ordinary Parisian folks. And he's extremely popular among them. So eventually he leaves the National Convention. And the reason he is in a bathtub at the time of his death is because he had a debilitating skin condition that has never definitively been diagnosed. But um, whatever it was, it caused him to break out in boils. And they were quite unsightly. And one way that he had of kind of alleviating some of the pain that came with this was to wrap his head in a vinegar-soaked towel. And yeah. also, yes. Wait, I'm just remembering and, the, the bathtub guy had like a turban on. Yes. Exactly. That's yeah. what he would do. And he would also do a lot of his work in the bathtub because it kind of soothed some of the pain. So Marat is um, not exactly a beloved figure because of his incendiary rhetoric and calls to violence and all that. And um, he's particularly hated by the Girondins, who are these moderate revolutionaries, right? So 
His killer is named Charlotte Corday. She's 24 years old at the time of the assassination. And she comes from a minor aristocratic household, but is actually friendly to the revolution. And she's a Girondin. And that's part of why she takes issue with Marat. And she decides that he poses such a grave threat to French society that she needs to take it upon herself to kill him. So she leaves her home, goes to Paris, hits up the Palais Royale. I do love this part of the story because she goes to the Palais Royale and buys a six-inch kitchen knife, as well as a really fetching hat with like a green with with some kind of green streamers or something on it and uh, basically so that she can look like really good while she commits murder people kind of remember her as this green lantern style figure like speeding through the streets of paris while hunting marat and there's like this streak of green coming from her hat so eventually she devises a scheme to get into marat's um bathroom where where he is um she claims that she has knowledge of this Girondin conspiracy and she is ready to name some names and then he can send them off to the guillotine or do whatever he wants to do. So that's how she's able to get in. He, he believes her and he essentially invites his own killer into his home. So she stands there in front of his bathtub. She starts naming some names and then she pounces on him and stabs him. The blow is fatal. Soon... Marat's wife has come into the room and discovered the murder, notifies the police. Crowds gather outside his house, already mourning, because even though Marat was seen as so dangerous, he had this devout following. And so he was seen as a martyr uh, because he had died kind of for the revolution. But on the other hand, Charlotte Corday was also seen as a martyr because she, of course, was tried and executed. Uh, went to the guillotine, had her portrait done in prison because, you know, she's like, want to preserve my image for the public. Um, There were some people who celebrated her and she apparently went to the guillotine with such self-possession that she awed many onlookers. They were just like, oh my God, like she does not regret having committed this crime at all. And actually one man scribbled in his diary, it's like for seven or eight days, I was in love with Charlotte Corday. So she became <laughs> something of like, I, right? Isn't it great? She became something of a celebrity um, yeah. and was also seen as someone who died for a real cause. So it was one murder and two martyrs. And now for a quick advertising break. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Something I love about November is that it really highlights the importance of gratitude. I'm so grateful to all the people in my life that are sources of joy and support, but someone I don't often think enough is myself. Taking a moment every once in a while to express gratitude to yourself for carrying you through this year is just as important as giving thanks to our loved ones. I am definitely grateful to myself for prioritizing my mental health this year. I started seeing a new therapist at the beginning of this year, and I can confidently say it's one of the most impactful decisions I made for myself in 2024. I love having a space that allows me to sort through difficult or complicated feelings and also gives me the opportunity to reflect on the growth I've made with someone who's watched me work through all the steps to get there. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. Because it's entirely online, it can work with your schedule, not the other way around. To get started, you just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. And if, like me, you need to switch therapists at any time, you can do that easily and without any additional charges. Let the gratitude flow with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash vulgar today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash vulgar. As a podcast network, our first priority has always been audio and the stories we're able to share with you. But at Realm, we also sell some pretty cool merch, and organizing that was made both possible and easy with Shopify. When you think about successful businesses like Allo or Allbirds or Skims, an often overlooked secret is the business behind the business that makes selling and, for shoppers, buying simple. For millions of businesses, that business is Shopify. That's because nobody does selling better than Shopify. It's the home of the number one checkout on the planet. And the not-so-secret secret secret that's definitely worth talking about is that ShopPay boosts conversions up to 50%. That's more happy customers and way more sales going... If you're hoping to grow your business, your commerce platform better be ready to sell wherever your customers are scrolling or strolling, on the web, in your store, in their feed, and everywhere in between. Businesses that sell more sell on Shopify. 
Upgrade your business and get the same checkout we use with Shopify. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash realm, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash realm to upgrade your selling today. Shopify.com slash realm. What is that smell? It's that slight crispness of fall, maybe a bit of apple cider or pumpkin spice, and I am definitely getting a hint of a deal. Oh wait, it's it's more than a hint. (laughs) Yeah, these are the best deals, and not just this season, but all year long. In all seriousness, the smartest shoppers know that you get the brands you love with the most savings and cash back with Rakuten. And I know I'm certainly interested in sniffing out those deals. Start getting cash back at your favorite stores like Urban Outfitters, Petco, even Expedia if you're looking to get some travel in before the end of the year. And getting cash back doesn't mean you have to miss out on sales because those can be stacked right on top. It's easy to use and based on a simple idea. Stores pay Rakuten for sending them shoppers and Rakuten shares the money with you as cash back through PayPal or check. Smells like a perfect deal to me. Download the free Rakuten app and never miss a deal. Or go to Rakuten.com to start getting the most bang for your buck. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N. As a podcast network, our first priority has always been audio and the stories we're able to share with you. But at Realm, we also sell some pretty cool merch, and organizing that was made both possible and easy with Shopify. When you think about successful businesses like Allo or Allbirds or Skims, an often overlooked secret is the business behind the business that makes selling and for shoppers buying simple. For millions of businesses, that business is Shopify. That's because nobody does selling better than Shopify. It's the home of the number one checkout on the planet. And the not so secret secret that's definitely worth talking about is that ShopPay boosts conversions up to 50%. That's more happy customers and way more sales going. If you're hoping to grow your business, your commerce platform better be ready to sell wherever your customers are scrolling or strolling, on the web, in your store, in their feed, and everywhere in between. Businesses that sell more, sell on Shopify. Upgrade your business and get the same checkout we use with Shopify. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash realm, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash realm to upgrade your selling today. Shopify.com slash realm. And we're back. And Madame T is, well, I'm picturing Charlotte Corday is running through with the green ribbon. <laughs> yeah. And I'm picturing Madame T is like, there's been a murder. I need to make a wax work. Like she's running to the crime scene. Yes. That, that's basically it, right? Yes. That's, that's the, the story is that she is summoned again by the National Assembly. So if she refuses, you know, she could be put to death or something. She goes to Mara's bathtub, makes sketches there and then works from them. And that's how she creates this tableau. Listeners might know, might be familiar with a painting by Jacques-Louis David. It's a really iconic image. It also depicts Marat dead in his bathtub. And it's made in the same year. And Madame Tussaud claims to have inspired the composition of that painting with her tableau, which is a claim that it's like really hard to confirm or refute, but it's, it's something that she claimed. But yeah, so she unveils a tableau of of the slain Marat in the Wax Museum. And people kind of go there almost on a kind of pilgrimage to like, you know, view the fallen champion of the people and and all that. And it's, I I mean, again, I've not been to the Chamber of Horrors since I was a child, but it's back there. And that was a memorable part of the Chamber of Horrors was this bathtub tableau. Yeah. So the French Revolution is like, it's happening. It's there. Eventually she leaves France. Yes. To go to England. Why did she leave? Okay, so this is another perfect part of the story because this is the Halloween episode. So in 1802, she goes into business with this guy who has various names, Paul Philidor, Paul de Philip Stahl. I'm just going to call him Philip Stahl. But he was a phantasmagoria performer. And so what the phantasmagoria was briefly was an art form that revolved around an instrument called the Magic Lantern, which is basically a precursor to the modern day slide projector. So the Phantasmagoria was a bunch of images projected on a projection surface 
like a wall, of skeletons and ghosts and other spooks. And indeed, in Paris, toward the end of the 1790s, when things had cooled down just a little bit, they would project images of like Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. Um, and they were supposed to be like ghosts because obviously they had died earlier that decade. But these performances were held in complete darkness and they freaked people out. People literally fainted in the performance venues. And sometimes they would d project these images on columns of smoke. So you have to imagine like seeing the projected image of a ghost on billowing smoke would kind of give it this illusion of, you know, insubstantiality. And it's like, it's like the late 1700s. Like there's not TV. There's not like people like this is crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. And it's, it's just such a jolt, right? I mean, uh, one thing that I actually love is that you know, today when we go to see a movie or a play, we watch them in, in darkness, right? We're used to that. The lights go down. That was not how things were done in the 18th century. So if you went to see a play, you were going to watch it by candlelight and hundreds of candles had to be lit by someone at that theater. And as I mentioned, these Phantasmagoria shows were held in complete darkness. And that in itself just freaked people out, you know? And then, of course, you add ghosts on that. And it's, it's basically, you know, precursors to modern horror films, yeah. right? Um, so this is who Tussaud partners with in 1802. And he offers to go with her to London. And it's a really tough decision for Madame Tussaud because she's lived in Paris for pretty much her entire life. Um, her ch she has two young children. Will they both be able to go with her? Her mother at this point is still around and is quite aged. What will happen to her? Eventually, she decides to leave and she takes her older son, Joseph, with her and leaves her younger son, Francis, who's two behind. And when she leaves, she never sees her husband or her mother again, nor does she ever return to Paris. So she doesn't know it when she's leaving, but she is never going back. So it's just a huge moment in her life. And you have to imagine a decision that she would not have taken lightly. So she moves to London and quickly learns that Philip Stahl is a total snake and a jerk. So he has made a pretty tough bargain with her. She has to cover all the cost of her own transportation. And then on top of that, he is entitled to 50% of all of her earnings, plus whatever he makes, right? Because he has kind of a bankable name in London at this point. And beyond that, Tussaud does not really know a word of English when she moves to the British capital. So she's relying on him to help promote her waxworks, right? He does not do that. There's like not a word to spare about her wax museum in the press. Instead, he's touting his own phantasmagoria and the automata that he was exhibiting. And then on top of that, they open up shop in a venue called the Lyceum Theater. He takes the ground floor and then he makes Tussaud exhibit her wares in the basement, which I think is just like, you know, it's just not cool. It's not cool. And so life is really hard for Madame T in the British capital. She's living in extreme isolation, can barely say anything in English apart from please and thank you. She's homesick. Her youngest son is still with Francois Tussaud, her husband. Business is not doing well. And then finally, she gets a big break. And again, as you mentioned, she is nothing if not a massively astute businesswoman. She like knows, she has her thumb on the pulse of public opinion. A big cause celeb captivates London. It's the, the execution of a guy named Colonel Marcus Edward Despard, who is um, a traitor. He was basically found guilty of participating in a conspiracy to assassinate the king. And I go into detail about his life story, which is absolutely fascinating on the podcast. But for now, we'll just say he was a really interesting figure and um, his execution was kind of a hot topic. So she makes a, a figure of him and then suddenly business booms. Everyone wants to come see what he looked like in real life because he is just the talk of the town. Right. No, it's like what I was saying before. It's the whole sort of like there's not Instagram, there's not tabloids, there's not people 
want to know like this famous person what did they look like like what did they look like exactly yeah. yeah and and even beyond that i would say too that part of it is wanting to know what they look like but also one of the things that i think is so interesting and creepy and slightly off putting but also cool about wax figures is that they almost seem alive right like Wax figures offer an illusion of proximity to power or fame or wealth, or in the case of people in the Chamber of Horrors, infamy, right? It feels like you're almost in the presence of them because these wax figures have this creepy, uncanny life to them. So yeah, that's a big part of it too. Well, and also I think I read that um, her mentor, but then also Madame T herself, like people had been doing waxworks before, but what they were really good at was the skin tone. Like they were able to make it, make them look real to an extent that they hadn't really before. Yeah, I think I read that Kurt, you had like secret recipes for all these different skin tones. And of course he transmitted that knowledge to his star people. Yeah, so exactly. So it's like you would go in and like, like now, like wax museums, what they're doing mostly in Madame Tussauds in London right now. Like there's an ad I saw there and it was like Amy Winehouse and Freddie Mercury and like uh-huh. Harry Styles. And I'm just like, what is this an ad for? And they're all standing on the tube. And I'm like, oh, it's an ad for Madame Tussauds. Oh, those are the wax works. Like they look <laughs> so real. Yes, that yeah. is it. That's, I mean, that's how you know they've pulled it off, right? When you mistake the wax figure for the real live person. <laughs> that's the ultimate. There are great um, anecdotes about that in Tussauds biography. And Well, and then also, so I mean, like we're gonna, you know, like, everyone should listen to your podcast to get into like the full depth and the breadth of Madame T's life. But like this is, so she hits a bit. She's doing well in England. She's got like a touring exhibition. Um, Eventually she like sets up shop in London herself. Part of what I've been reading about is like she did when Napoleon died, she had like, she acquired some of his things so that people could come by and see the waxwork of Napoleon. But also I forget what it was, you know, like his sword or like whatever, like she had, so she was getting, she had the waxwork so people could see this famous person, but also see their stuff. Like she was getting into kind of like acquiring things, including the clothing of the actual people. One thing I encountered in my research for my book is that um, after George the fourth, he had, his coronation, he had this incredible long like cape, this like robe that like trailed down behind him when he was going down Westminster Abbey. And she bought the cloak to put on her George the Fourth figure. Like she was showing people so you could see what they look like in real life, but also what their things look like, like these fabulous wealthy things. Yeah. I mean, to your point about Napoleon, by the time she settled down in London toward the end of her career, she actually, her museum held the premier collection of Napoleonic relics in the world, which is one of these interesting facts about her museum that just knocked me over. The most famous artifact in there was like the carriage that he had ridden in to escape at the Battle of Waterloo. And you could sit in it, you know, if you were a visitor. No. So this is like she was staying on top of the pulse of what people were interested in, what people like she knew like Napoleon was such a big deal. Like those wars went on forever. But the people, like, whatever she paid to get that carriage, she knew that she would earn so much more of people coming to sit in the carriage. Yeah. But so as an example of her sort of like, like, she's still, she's thriving. She's like becoming the sort of like the old little woman that I kind of picture because that's what her waxwork of herself looks like. Yeah. In his later years. But you wanted to also talk, I think it's a good example of these later years and her continuing to... um find what people were interested in in very gruesome ways. So the Maria Manning murder trial. Yeah. So eventually, as you mentioned, she ends up in in London. She tours the provinces for like 30 years. Both her sons come to join her. So she's running a family business. And then she settles down in London finally in 1836. And this is when the Chamber of Horrors becomes like one of the hottest attractions at um, Madame Tussauds. And it, it, she starts updating it on a regular basis. And she hadn't done that until this point during her time in the UK. I think partly because it was seen as kind of controversial to unveil figures of notorious criminals. It could be seen, you know, she could be seen to, to glorify them. So in 1849, she causes a real controversy with the unveiling of um, effigies of the, George and Maria Manning. So in 1849, 
George Maria Manning invites a friend of theirs, Patrick O'Connor, over to dinner at their house in Bermondsey. And Bermondsey was a working class neighborhood in London. O'Connor goes missing. A family member starts to investigate. (laughs) The house starts to smell bad. Yeah. Police start to close in on the Mannings. They get the hell out of Dodge. They both flee and part ways. So the police go in and basically discover O'Connor's body buried beneath the floor of the Manning's back kitchen. So this causes this is like a horrible crime, right? They had defiled the kind of sacred sphere of the home. And the wor- the Victorians worshipped domesticity, right? So you can just imagine that this was like an unthinkable crime. So what follows is some really ace police work. It has to be said, Maria Manning flees to Edinburgh. And then George Manning flees to the Isle of Jersey in the English Channel. The police capture both of them, even though the Mannings have a, you know, a head start of, a several, of several days and have covered a lot of miles. They're brought on trial. Um, and Maria Manning really causes a sensation in the press. She's strongly associated with Lady Macbeth, Shakespeare's famous character, because she's just so ferocious. And she's also seen as kind of masculine and domineering in ways that recalled the character of Lady Macbeth. Uh, And she also, maybe you're going to talk about this, but she wore black, a shiny black dress. Exactly. Yeah. And the, the, that became sort of like um, Charlotte Corday's green hat, you know, like this black shiny dress became like a real thing. Yes. So she was famous for, she, she looked good. She dressed really sharply and she appeared in court wearing black satin. So part of why this is important is, and as I mentioned, they lived in Bermondsey, which was a working class district. But black satin was in many ways associated with like the middle class and a sense of respectability. So some of the classist journalists who reported on this trial saw this as evidence of Maria Manning's trying to rise above her station, right? And if people know the play Macbeth, um, they know that it's all about ambition, right? Macbeth wants to ascend the throne as king and Lady Macbeth wants to help him get there. So there's this ambition, this desire to rise there. And then in the case of Maria Manning, she was trying to climb the social ladder by masquerading as like a middle-class woman. So that was part of why Victorians associated her with the character of Lady Macbeth. So she's really ferocious. She looks devastating in black. Um, And in the courtroom, there's this amazing sequence. She does not get a fair trial um, because the only evidence really against her comes from George Manning. But anyway, when the guilty verdict comes down, she loses her mind and stands up and just launches into a diatribe against everyone present, the judge, the jury, everyone. And it's extremely fluid and it's ex- she's just in a rage, you know? And um, in front of her and the dock are sprigs of rue, which was this herb that was thought to like, ba- it was basically like a public health measure. She picks up sprigs of rue and casts them into the courtroom. Just this display of pure unalloyed contempt, very theatrical in a way, right? Um, And everyone is just shocked by it, but they're also kind of obsessed with her because she is larger than life and they can't stop talking about her. So they're executed. Shortly after they're executed, um, Tussauds does what Tussauds always did, and they actually procured the clothes that George and Maria Manning had worn in court, and then they use those clothes to dress wax figures of them at the Chamber of Horrors. So she gets the black satin dress, basically. Yes, yeah, yes. It's supposedly the the black satin ga- gown that Maria Manning actually wore. And I did find a newspaper article about Tussauds' plans to buy these garments. So it seems very possible that it actually is the real garment. It's not something that. Tussauds made up this time. And this causes just an absolute scandal in the press, partly because the effigy of Maria Manning was really, like, beautiful. And she was wearing this black satin gown. And uh, because she was associated with um, a character like Lady Macbeth, which is, like, the ultimate star vehicle for Shakespearean actresses, there's also this sense of glamour that kind of went, and, and this sense of theatrical celebrity, almost, that went along with the sculpture. So there's one journalist named Douglas Gerald who just lays into Madame Tussauds in the press for kind of glamorizing 
um, a, a murderer by representing her uh, in the Chamber of Horrors. Yeah, and it's interesting because, like, Madame Tussauds, this is what she's always done. Like, she she's um, found what people are interested in, what people would pay money to come and see in the museum. Like, in the at first, it was, like, well, I guess this was more um, her mentor, but it was, like, the French royal family. And then it was kind of like, oh, no, now people kind of want to see murders. Okay, like, this is nothing yeah. new for her. But yeah, just the fact that it was so recent, maybe, or it was, yeah. Well, it, And it's the same as people now. Like, there's discussion about, you know, true crime documentaries and stuff. Yeah. And it's like, is this exploiting people? Is this, you know, it, it's a similar conversation, I guess. But for Madame Tussauds, it's like, well, this is what she's always done. This is nothing new. She's just giving the people what they want, you know? And she has her mind on her money and her money on her mind. It's like, it's going to sell tickets. People will... You had, it, What's funny is you had to pay an extra six pence to go into the Chamber of Horrors. Yeah. So of course she wants to keep that updated, right? Because she wants those, those six pence. <laughs> <laughs> well, and also I think, like at this point, I'm not sure what year we're in, but this is like we're in the Victorian era. Like she... Yeah. You know, like, there's still an interest, I'm sure, in seeing, like, Marie Antoinette's death mask and, like, the Uh bathtub scene and stuff. But, like, that's old news. Like, people want to know. That's People are visiting the Wax Museum who weren't born when that all happened. Like, they want things that are relevant to them. Yeah. Well, it's... There's a common... So... There's a combination. So the 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 tableau is still around in the Chamber of Horrors. And the Chamber of Horrors itself is actually kind of modeled on a courtroom at the Old Bailey. So all of the um, criminal likenesses are in what is called the dock. So it's meant to look like a courtroom dock, except it's yeah. like oversized. Um, so there's a bit there. But, so there are so there are these relics of the French Revolution, which is part of why she could she so could be like this isn't exploitative trash like this is historical instruction and um look at maria manning you know so yeah there's a there's a mingling of like of 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 um history as well as current events and like you know you know basically what we would think of as true crime culture today like you said yeah. with documentaries yeah so it's just people have always been interested in learning about this yeah um and well and also just in a pre-photography era like all that you have in the newspapers are kind of sketches and drawings but people really want to know but what did they look like and that's what she's providing for the people exactly oh one thing i had to mention too because i think it's so funny at this point this is 1849 with maria manning and madame tussauds is like 89 years old at this point and douglas gerald is just like railing against her (laughs) as like the height of moral depravity she's just this granny you know i always find that funny (laughs) Well, and that's kind of like the the waxwork of Madame Tussauds, I think, is was it made after she died or I don't know. But like it's she's this little old lady is what you see when you see the waxwork of Madame Tussauds herself. Yeah. So she she had various um, waxworks of herself throughout her career. And Mm -hmm. part of that was just um, as a way of showing how good she was at wax modeling. Right. Because she was always there to greet customers when they entered. But they could also compare her to the wax model of her. And it was mm. stunningly lifelike, stunningly to accurate. Show. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. So it's yeah. like, I look like this. And that means that this <laughs> looks like that person. And this looks like that person. Exactly. And there are all these wonderful anecdotes about people mistaking, you know, the wax figure of Tussauds for the real woman. And yeah, so. Well, even today, sometimes... You see a picture like Madame Tussauds unveils a new figure of, you know, whatever, like Zendaya. And there's a picture of like Zendaya and there's a picture of the wax figure. And you can usually tell which is the wax figure, but not always. Not Not always. always. Yeah. Sometimes they're really good. Yeah. Just the angle, the the photography. Yes, they're they're, they are really good. Sometimes they're bad, but (laughs) they're usually the Tussauds ones are usually good. Yes. Um, There are other wax museums. But so she died shortly after this. Like she... So 1850 is what I'm seeing is when she died. Yes, that's right. In fact, Douglas Gerald is pretty much railing against her in the press until like her dying day. Yeah. <laughs> I think he finally pipes down as soon as she dies. And he's like, okay, maybe this is in bad taste. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe too, um, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but she, like in terms just of name recognition, like again, like it's, I remember when I was a child, not Madame Tussauds story, but the day that I realized that Walt Disney was a person, I was like, what? Right, right. Like that's just a name you see before it's movies. It's so funny. You you think that like the brand exists in isolation of someone who started the brand. But yeah, but that's such a great example. It's, it's so... Yeah. 
it's so similar to to Madame Tussauds because definitely there was a point in my life where like I knew that Madame Tussauds was like the wax museum. And then I was like, oh wait, really? Like there was there was a there was, there was a, a real historical <laughs> figure named Madame Tussauds. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. So I, you're going to join me now as we um, wrap this up with uh, scoring her on the scandaliciousness scale. All right, scandal. So there are four categories. We'll go through them. And so it's all like a scale of zero to 10 per category. Mm -hmm. So the first category is scandaliciousness. How scandalous was she? How scandalous was Madame Tussauds? I feel like she has to come in like the low to middle range in this one because and primarily because of the Chamber of Horrors, because there were actually a lot of detractors who considered it immoral to represent notorious murderers in public and then ask people to pay to see them. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I would say like three or yeah, four. Yeah, that's, that's kind of where, like, it's tricky because there were people who were scandalized by what she did, but there was even more people who paid their sixpence and went to see it. Right, like right. Like, the stuff she was doing, culturally, society was, like, on board for it. It was on board. In general. Yeah, yeah. But, there, but there were those detractors, so I think, I think a three is definitely fair. Three? But otherwise, yeah. like, as a person, like, as a person, she was, like, married, she had children, like, there was never any scandal about her personal life, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, well, one thing that's interesting. Yeah, I don't think it was. It, it wasn't really scandalous. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know of anything too scandalous about her. Maybe you could talk about like the degree to which she just lied about her biography. <laughs> but I don't. I don't know. Just like all the things she made up. Um, but I don't know if anyone was scandalized by no, that. No, I think yeah. everyone just kind of thought that was funny. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the next category is her scheminess, and I th and this is like not just like literal schemes, like haha, I'm making a scheme, but just like having a plan, having a strategy, always thinking ten steps ahead. And I think this is where she's going to get a good score because she okay. like created this industry. Yeah. I mean, I think yeah. she has to be. I mean, one thing that we didn't um, get into, but you know, today, like Madame Tussauds is an international tourist destination in London, right? It already had that reputation in her lifetime. I mean, she was like an institution by the time mm -hmm. she died. So she was just this amazing businesswoman. She knew exactly what people wanted and she kept giving it to them. And she, whenever she, you know, made profit at the wax museum she turned around and invested that money right back into the wax museum so that she can make it bigger better newer etc to keep the people coming back so i think i don't know i, I don't know what a 10 is um but i feel like she, she's got to be like pretty close to a 10 she was she was also I'm, a woman who owned her own business at this point in history which was very rare um, well, I'm happy. I'm happy with the 10. And I think especially everything you just said, and also the part where you were talking about, she came to London, she was screwed over by this phantasmagoria guy, she didn't speak English, she was stuck in the basement, right? And she schemed her way out of that to become yes. the person like she, she everything was like, not everything was against her, but a lot was against her being like, not speaking the language, being a woman. Like, what are wax works? Like, how do you... <laughs> They're weird. It's a niche. It's always been a bit of a niche art form. But she's yeah. like, she makes wax works that everybody wants to see. I mean, what? Well, <laughs> no, exactly. And that's the thing. And that's where, like, so Custis, her her mentor, like, he was like, oh, it's the French royal family. It's whatever. And then she's like, you know, who it's going to be murderers, dead that's people. Right. Like, she, she made that pivot that really made it so popular. And it was one of the things I remember reading in that biography was that... um she made it it was one of the first museums that was really like you were saying it's like approachable to just everybody like it wasn't because there were museums that had in london that had been sort of like for right. more mm -hmm. highbrow people but this is like before the vna the victorian albert museum like before exactly. there were other museums intended to like educate the lower classes like she mm -hmm. was creating mm -hmm. this experience to and also just the almost the invention of that sort of true crime celebrity thing like that's that's getting into the next category which is significance but i do think yeah. scheminess is 10 but scheminess that's our 10 next, definitely yeah. but the significance so where would you score her for that again i mean has to be like nine or ten because she was a wax madame tussaud was a wax modeler in like the 19th century and now like she has given birth essentially to an international entertainment empire like 
everybody knows her name. She's a wax modeler. And I, I yeah, I mean, it's global. The, the business is global in scale. And uh, I don't know. I think it, it you'd be hard pressed to find many artists from the 19th century who have that kind of name recognition today where everybody knows everybody knows who they are even if they even if they don't realize that there was a real historical madame tussaud they know there's a wax museum and so they're not surprised to learn that hey there was a wax modeler named madame tussaud so i would have to go with like 9 or 10 i think i'm going to go with a 10 for this as well i think just she yeah, the name recognition, just among like average everyday people who don't know the names of maybe any artists, but Madame Tussauds is just like, you you just kind of know that brand, like Walt Disney. But then exactly. also just what she did to, um, to, to popularize this sort of like celebrity culture, but also to sort of democratize it. Like, so if you could walk up and see a wax effigy of the king, then like, that takes away a bit of the grandeur of it. It takes away a bit of sort of the mystery of it. And so it's sort of like flattening out class structure in some ways, like just to, it's a radical thing to do in that way. Yeah, I think it, she definitely deserves some credit for that. I think, you know, what she was doing too was like instructive and artistic. You know, like there's a National Portrait Gallery in London. We have a National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. as well. And these are considered important cultural institutions because they show you what people used to look like. Mm -hmm. And that's something similar to what Madame Tussaud was doing because she had Napoleon and criminals and all that, but she also had like Henry VIII and Mary Queen of Scots and Elizabeth. And, you know, so I think there was a historical... Um, I do think there's an argument to be made that she was imparting historical instruction to people as well. And she had found mm -hmm. a really effective and interesting way to do that. And it was really effective. Like, I remember the Chamber of Horrors from when I, right. when I was a child. And I also remember at that time, it's not there anymore, but there was there was the Henry VIII and his six wives wax figures. And I remember those so strong. Like, so, and seeing them, because I yeah. was like a kid who was into like Henry VIII and his six wives. Um, but seeing the wax figures, it's a different thing to see like, oh, that's what they would have looked like. Like, it's it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It helps you imagine the past, you know, in in a small yet meaningful way. Yeah, it's like a real place. Like, people aren't just a head and shoulders in a painting. It's like, oh, that's a person. Like, that's how tall maybe they were. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The final category is the, um, I call it the sexism bonus. And this is where we give bonus points. So, like, a 10 on the sexism bonus would be, like, somebody who was, you know, trapped by their husband in a tower for 25 years because she... <laughs> sneeze too loudly once okay um, right. like how much how much did sexism hold her back and i think i don't know if it did much I, i'm sure it did to some extent but i think yeah not much. i think it's uh, she's almost the polar opposite of the damsel trapped in the tower for sneezing too loud um i think one thing that i did want to highlight is that when she married francois tussaud she actually negotiated a prenuptial agreement that allowed her to retain control of her business, which was extremely uncommon for women at this time. They were often expected to like cede all of their assets to her husband. And then once she leaves Paris, there's actually this pretty devastating letter where she's just like, Francois, I'm not coming home. Like, I don't want to see you again, basically. <laughs> she's like, this is my jam. I'm going to keep doing my jam and like, see you again, never smell you later, that kind of thing. And, um, you know, it becomes her business and she enjoys, I, I, there are not many women like her at this point in history who were the sole proprietors of a business and not just a business, but one that became so massive. So yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think she was ever held. She might've had some sexism with Philip Stahl, her business partner that brought her to London. She had a hell of a time buying her way out of that contract. But but yeah, I, I think she she achieved what so many women could not achieve in, in her day. So I, I think in that regard, maybe it is is it one or zero? Can you get a zero or one? What's the lowest again? You you could get a zero, but I'm gonna give her a one. I would because say like of one. Because of the the Phantasmagoria guy. Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair. Yeah. So then this gives her a total score of 24. And I like to sort of see, you know, where does that where does she fall? Put her up against other people. You, I know you've heard my episode about Rochelle, the yes. actress. Yes. Rochelle, Rochelle has a 26. 
Oh, she's Madame a 26. T. Wow. Okay. Madame T has a 24. So that's that's her neighborhood. Good. I'm if if she's like hanging out with Rochelle, I'm more than happy about that. And actually, um, when this comes out, the episode will have aired. But I did uh, a rare episode about a man in history. We did um, a two part uh-huh. about about uh, the Marquis de Lafayette. Uh huh. And Lafayette has a twenty three. So Madame oh, T, she's she's between Lafayette and Rochelle. So just like as French people, <laughs> yes, French people who are kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. That's, their, that's her neighborhood. That's awesome. I I'm super happy with that. I mean, if she's she's kicking it, she's like, you know, having a salon with Marquis de Lafayette and Rochelle. I think yeah. she's li- living her best wax in life. Yeah, I don't know if she ever made a wax figure of Rochelle, but I can't imagine she didn't. Rochelle was so famous. <laughs> She probably was. I uh, I think she was a little. I don't know exa- her exact dates. Rochelle was like um, eighteen eighteen twenties. Okay, then she she might have been. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I do know there was a fire in like eighteen forty five that destroyed some of um, the waxworks. This is again my book research because I was like, oh, I wonder what the waxwork of like Carolina Brunswick and her lover looked like. But like they were destroyed in that fire oh, so no there's some and this and it was pre-photography so i'll never know what they look like alas that was where i was Mask. like if i could get a time machine the one thing i would do is go to madame tussauds <laughs> <laughs> in like 1821 just to see what those look like yeah but, that and the madame du barry wax yeah work would... the like recline the yeah the madame du barry wax work where she's it's the sleeping beauty right where she's like reclining I think that's right it's very Ooh, it's, you know, gets it's, everyone hot it's, and bothered. It's a little erotic, yeah. It's a little erotic, but who are we dealing with here, you know? It's Madame de Berry. Come on. It's Madame de Berry. Come on. So <laughs> please tell everybody about um, your podcast and where they can follow you and things like that. So people can learn more about Madame Tussauds, but also the other things you talk about. Yeah. So again, the podcast is called The Art of Crime. Uh, you can listen to it wherever you get your podcast, blah, blah, blah. Um, you can follow me on Instagram. And I'm just getting ready to start a new season, which is called Crimes of Old New York. So it's all about um, crimes that took place in New York. Uh, And they're kind of more tangentially related to artists and stuff. I think there's an episode coming out this season that listeners of this show would really like. It's about Mae West. Oh, I love Mae West. Yes. Yes. I mean... It doesn't get much more tits out than Mae yeah. West, right? Oh, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, come on. But she she went to jail for writing this play called Sex, which was about a sex worker. I mean, it, the, the whole story is just so delicious. And, and Mae West is like such a personality. So anyway, yeah. So Art of Crime, everybody should listen. Um, your whole Madame Tussauds season, people can fill in all the blanks that so we had to jump over. We, That's you right. and I were We were scheming. It's like, how can we make this be like an hour, an hour and a half episode when you've like done an entire season about her but i think we figured out a way we figured i think we made it work absolutely yeah so thank you so much gavin for joining me for this special halloween episode Ooh, i hope everyone (laughs) is is, uh, spines have tingled yes Yes. (laughs) (laughs) thank you so much for joining me yeah thanks for having me again it was a blast so a few things that i like to remind everybody of at the end of every episode so firstly, if you want to see the whole scandalicious scale, I've done, I don't even know, a hundred something episodes. And every person who we, we score on the scale is, I have a document in front of me, but also you can see the whole scandalicious scale. If you go to vulgarhistory.com, there's a thing that says scores. So you can see where Madame T, who, who she's next to on the scale and where, where your faves fit in. And maybe you could find an episode to listen to if you want to see who has the highest score or who has the lowest score or things like that. And also you can follow me on Instagram. I'm at Vulgar History Pod. I'm also increasingly present on threads, which is like taking off an interesting way, at least for like history adjacent stuff. Um, also Vulgar History Pod on threads. And then also you can follow me on Substack, which I'm also having a really nice time. If you don't know Substack, it's, uh, I guess it's kind of like a social media thing, but it's also sort of like, it feels like blogs back in the day. It's just people like... Um, previous guest of this podcast, Leah Redman Chang is on there writing. She actually just wrote a really amazing thing about women in history and how often it says like they died in childbirth. And it kind of like you stop thinking about what that means, but looking at like, what does that actually mean? And what does that mean for like people's reproductive health um, in this day and age? It's really good. 
I actually put a link to that in the show notes as well, because, you know, Halloween, what's scarier than like reproductive rights being threatened by governments? Anyway, I'm on Substack. It's uh, so every other week, although this month I've been doing every week because of Halloween. Anyway, and I'm I'm a fan of Halloween. So you go to vulgarhistory.substack.com and you will find my newsletter there. And if you subscribe to it, then you will get just sent to your inbox in your email my every other week essays about women in history. And it, I don't know, it's it's a nice community there. Ever since the social media landscape kind of exploded, I've been sort of figuring out like, where can I go to like connect with the people about the things that are interesting to me? And Substack has been one of those places. Anyway, also just because of the way that social media is, I really want my um, people who follow me and want to know what I'm up to and want to discuss the episodes. I want you to be able to have a place to do that. And where I've found the best place for that is um, on my Patreon, which you can join for free or for money. Either way, you can keep up to date with what's going on there on the Patreon. So to do that, you go to patreon.com slash Ann Foster Writer and you just join. And then what happens there is whenever I post something, depending on if you're a free member, let's say, then you'll get a message whenever I post something new. There's also a chat there that everybody can join to talk to other members of the Tits Out Brigade. And also for all the free members, I've been posting bonus podcasts of just updates from me. You may or may not know. If you're a new listener, you may not know. Other listeners, you very much know that all this year I've been working on writing a book about Caroline of Brunswick and I wanted to um, talk about it. So I've been posting some book updates there on Patreon for free. Um, It's called Anne is Writing a Book. Just... They're all like 30 minute episodes. Friend of the podcast, Alison Epstein was on one of them because I was really mad about how much Napoleon is showing up in my book. And so Alison was there for me through that. Anyway, patreon.com slash Ann Foster Writer. You can join for free to get all those things. If you join for $1 or more a month, you get early ad-free access to episodes of this podcast. And if you join for $5 or more a month, you get the early ad-free access. You get all the stuff that free people get. And you also get bonus episodes of Vulgar Peace Theater, which we will be making new episodes of hopefully later this year, hopefully calendar year 2024. Stay tuned. The three of us, it's me, friend of the podcast, Lanoa Johnson, friend of the podcast, Alison Epstein. We're all very busy at the moment, but hopefully we'll be able to get some, some more of those recorded. But if you haven't listened to them, there's a whole backlog of these um, movie discussion podcasts where we talk about costume dramas. And also, if you join at the $5 or more a month, you get access to our Discord, which is kind of a more in-depth chat with like different channels. Like there's a channel where we can talk about the season of Survivor. And there's a channel where people share pictures of their beautiful pets. I also post spoilers there. And just like, it's a place for the Tits Up Brigade to all chit chat and get to know each other. So anyway, that's all going on there. I also have a brand partner, Common Era Jewelry, which is a woman owned small business that makes beautiful jewelry heirloom pieces inspired by women from history. So there's so much overlap between what Tori, the owner, what she has chosen to put on her pieces and what we've talked about on the podcast. She has a whole series or a collection of of pieces that are called difficult women, which are like women in history who have been described as difficult. And I love that phrase. I love that concept that's actually on my sub stack. I've been calling my series there difficult women as well. So there's people there we've talked about on the podcast. Anne Boleyn is there, Hatshepsut is there, Agrippina, Cleopatra, Boudicca, and then also women from mythology, and then also sort of like talismans. She's just put out one that's about um, reproductive stuff from classical history. Anyway, they're beautiful pieces. They are available in solid gold as well as in more affordable gold vermeil. And vulgar history listeners can always get 15% off your order from Common Era by going to commonera.com slash vulgar or using code vulgar at checkout. And if you want to get some vulgar history merchandise, we've got that too, including the new amazing design. So most of you are hearing this, it's the day before Halloween. So there might be time to like get something from the merch store to be your Halloween costume. But if you wanted your Halloween costume to be like the scariest thing of all, someone who writes a bad review of this podcast, you can, or someone about whom a person would write a bad review, I guess. Um, friend of the podcast and one of the artists I've collaborated with a bunch, um, Siobhan Gallagher, made a beautiful new design that says poorly researched, which is an insult that people like to say about me on Apple podcast reviews sometimes. So if you walk around wearing a shirt that says poorly researched and there's like a lip print on it, it's kind of Sabrina Carpenter coded. Anyway, that'll be scary to 
incels, basically. So, you know, that's that's the thing you could get. And also other beautiful things available at the merch store. So there's two merch stores. I know that's a bit much, but here's that's what's going on. If you're in the US, go to vulgarhistory.com slash store, and that takes you to our T public store. And if you're outside the US, the shipping is a lot better if you go to vulgarhistory.redbubble.com. And if you want to get in touch with me, of course you can. If you have thoughts, feedback, feelings, emotions, compliments, um, suggestions, you can get in touch with me by going to vulgarhistory.com um, where there's a little link there that says contact me and then and then you'll contact me and let me know your thoughts and feelings. And I hope everyone has like a, a wonderful and haunted Halloween, if that's your vibe. Next week, we're still in it. We're still in this French revolutionary era we're going to be talking about i i don't want to be too spoilery but i will say we're going to be talking about another artist someone who is less commercialized than madame t but anyway until next time my friends um keep your pants on and your tits out vulgar history is researched written and hosted by ann foster that's me the editor is christina lumagi the music is by the Severn Duo. The Vulgar History Show image is by Deborah Wong. Transcripts are written by Aveline Malik. Find transcripts of recent episodes at vulgarhistory.com. Listening to a podcast should be time well spent. And I promise it will be if you'll give this podcast a try. It's called Something You Should Know. I'm the host, Mike Carruthers, and in every episode, I talk with leading experts on topics I know you will find fascinating. From why people can't keep secrets, what your favorite music says about you, why your pet acts in strange ways, and so much more. Something You Should Know is designed to give you information you can use in your life and give you great intel that you can share with others. I'm told it's a binge-worthy podcast. And with over a thousand episodes, there's a lot to binge on. Something You Should Know has been ranked in the top of the Apple podcast charts consistently for a long time. I know you're going to like this. I just need to get you to try it. Something You Should Know. It's available wherever you listen to podcasts. Hi, I'm Jennifer, a co-founder of the Go Kid Go Network. At Go Kid Go, putting kids first is at the heart of every show that we produce. That's why we're so excited to introduce a brand new show to our network called The Search for the Silver Lining, a fantasy adventure series about a spirited young girl named Isla who time travels to the mythical land of Camelot. During her journey, Isla meets new friends, including King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table, and learns valuable life lessons with every quest, sword fight, and dragon ride. Positive and uplifting stories remind us all about the importance of kindness, friendship, honesty, and positivity. Join me and an all-star cast of actors, including Liam Neeson, Emily Blunt, Kristen Bell, Chris Hemsworth, among many others, in welcoming the Search for the Silver Lining podcast to the Go Kid Go Network by listening today. Look for the Search for the Silver Lining on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. What's up, everyone? It's Noah Daniels. Hey, y'all. I'm JJ. Hey, guys. It's Kat. And we're your hosts of the Real Hauntings podcast. We bring on guests who share their firsthand encounter ghost stories and supernatural experiences. Now on to the trailer. I've been warned to not tell this story, but I think because of the way it ends, it's okay to tell this story. Because some people say that with certain entities, to like speak of them or talk about them or in any way like portray them as powerful will attract them to other people. The creepiest thing about it to me is a lot of times it would wait for me to notice it. Like, it would just lay its arm out like this, and then I'd be like, where is it, where is it? And then I'd see it, and then it would just slither back. For more information on the Real Hauntings, Real Ghost Stories podcast, make sure you check out real.fm to learn more about our podcast and many other amazing podcasts.